Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and yes, I'm back. Uh, for those of you wondering where I've been these many months, rest assured I've not suffered another personal tragedy. I've just been extremely busy working for the Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada, which recently hired me full-time to be their curatorial projects manager. So very busy, very exciting time. It's basically my dream job and I've been having a lot of fun with it. Uh, but thankfully, also, it's given me a lot more spare time, more of a work-life divide compared to uh, writing scripts freelance for Today I Found Out. So hopefully now I will have enough spare time to put more content on this channel, something I've been really itching to do for quite some time. So expect a lot more content going forward. Uh, also, I am hoping to start producing content for the museum itself, videos on aircraft and other artifacts in their collection, so you can look forward to that as well. So one of the neatest aspects of my new job is I have full access to the museum's extensive collection of aviation artifacts, including this really neat device here. You'll remember a while back I did a video on a gun camera, which is a type of device used by fighter pilots during the Second World War, and afterwards to see if they had actually hit their targets in order to tally uh, scores or to uh, adjust operational doctrine and things like that. Well, right here we have a camera gun. This is a GC-16 gun camera 16 manufactured by the Fairchild Corporation, which before it manufactured aircraft, manufactured aerial cameras and continued to do so for many years after they entered the aircraft market. Now, this is one of many similar devices used by many countries during the Second World War in order to train anti-aircraft gunners, either on the ground or in the air. Now, shooting down a fast-moving aircraft is not a trivial skill to learn. If you've ever done uh, trap and skeet or hunted ducks or geese or things like that, you'll know that when shooting at a fast-moving target, you have to lead the target. You have to shoot in front of it at where it's going to be when the bullet arrives, rather than at where it is right now. Otherwise, your bullet will go to where the target is right now and go right behind it. And this takes quite a bit of practice to learn. And indeed, when recruiting aerial gunners, uh, recruiters during the Second World War tended to look for people who had a lot of experience with trap and skeet or with hunting waterfowl, uh, because they already had that instinct of exactly how much to lead the target. Now, in the 1930s and 1940s, the standard way of training aerial gunners was to use something called a target drogue, which was basically a big windsock that was towed behind an aircraft. And either aerial gunners in a training aircraft twin engine uh, simulating a bomber or fighter pilots would shoot at the target drogue. And sometimes they had uh, paint covered bullets with a different color for each gunner to see who actually hit the target and how many times. Uh, but there were a number of disadvantages of this technique. Uh, number one, these towing aircraft tended to be very slow and unmaneuverable. They traveled in straight lines, and this was not a great simulation of an enemy aircraft that's taking evasive action. Number two, you didn't get uh, real-time feedback. You had to wait until you landed, and they unfurled the target drogue and counted the holes to see who hit and how many times. And then finally, there's the small matter of using live ammunition in the vicinity of a manned aircraft, never a safe proposition. And indeed, this problem is why some of the first mass-produced aerial drones were invented. And I actually have a video that I wrote for Today I Found Out on that subject uh, that hopefully will be coming out any week now. But another solution to the problem of training aerial gunners, and one that saved a heck of a lot of ammunition, was to use one of these. Uh, like I said, many countries had devices like these. The British had one modeled on the Lewis. The Japanese had one modeled on their version of the Lewis. Uh, the Germans had one based on the MG-15. Uh, this is an American and Commonwealth uh, version. And as you can see, this is modeled on the Browning M1919, which was used in American service in 30-06 caliber and in Commonwealth service in 303 British caliber, where this type of machine gun was colloquially known just as the 303 Browning. Uh, it's in aircraft gunnery configuration. It's got this spade grip with a thumb trigger. Uh, the ground-based versions of the M1919 tended to have more of a pistol grip. Although there, this was intended for mainly aircraft gunnery training, there are pictures of this being used on a ground tripod mount 
uh, for use against low-flying aircraft. So while this looks like a machine gun, uh, this is actually a 16mm movie camera. Uh, you'll notice that the barrel is actually a dummy, and the real business end of the device is this camera lens right underneath the barrel. And if you look closely, you'll see that just like the ANN6 gun camera we looked at in the previous video, it's tinted yellow, and that's a blue light filter to increase contrast when you're shooting against a bright blue sky. Now, the idea behind this is that every time you pull the trigger, this would take a short burst of film with crosshair superimposed on it, and after a training session, you would land, you would develop the film, and the instructor could go through the film frame by frame and see if you were leading the target enough, if you were firing too long of bursts and wasting ammunition, and things like that. Seems pretty simple, but there are actually a couple of interesting design nuances that I'd really like to take a look at. So let's look a little bit closer at this. So the first thing to point out is we have the same style of mounting hardware as the regular M1919 machine gun. So this will fit on any mounts designed for that gun, really saves on logistics. We have again, uh, aircraft style spade grip in the back with a thumb trigger. We have a ring and bead sight with a front post that is adjustable for elevation. On the side right here, we have a round counter. This counts down and tells you how much ammunition, aka film, you have left in the camera and when you've run out of ammunition. Now, if we pop open the top cover here, we'll see a big rectangular slot. Uh, this would have taken film cartridges, which would have contained 25 feet of 16 millimeter film, and this recorded at 16 frames per second. Now this, uh, it was powered by an internal battery and you would actually swap that out by taking out this rear plug here. Uh, but unfortunately this has a couple of locking screws that it really wasn't able to loosen and it didn't want to break it. But if you actually look through the top cover into the rear and I'll try and film this, it's really hard to see. You'll see a little cylinder with some wires coming out of it and that's the battery compartment. So this was completely self-powered. You didn't have to actually plug it into the aircraft's electrical system like a lot of gun cameras. And another thing to note looking inside the cover is you'll see the cog right here that runs the round counter. Uh, that's actually not connected to anything in the gun itself. Uh, that would be connected to a cog on the film cartridge. So you would actually be counting directly from the cartridge how much film was left. So, so far, so straightforward. But there's a clever little design detail in this camera that I really wanted to go over because I just found it so nifty. And it's how this camera does timestamps. Now, today with digital video, we're very used to timestamps and you know, they're very simple to achieve and we almost expect them. But back in the 1940s, achieving a timestamp took a little bit of technical ingenuity. And let me show you how that works. So if we open up this little panel at the front here, you'll see there's a compartment where on one side you have four light bulbs connected to the battery. And on the other side, you have a flat plate that says put in watch. Now what this is referring to is something known as the 1935 Hamilton bomb timer watch. At least bomb timer is what the watch collecting community calls it has nothing to do with timing bombs, but was developed specifically for this device. And what it was, was a little square bezel chronometer that you would slip in here, and there's a little prism, a little flip up prism in here that projects the image of the watch onto the film, it bypasses the lens. And when you actually use this, when you push the trigger, it actually flips that prism up out of the way, and I'll show you that right now. Now, what that does is at the start of the burst, when you press the trigger, it's going to start the camera rolling while simultaneously flipping that prism out of the way. So it's going to project one frame of the watch face onto the film, and then the prism gets out of the way, and then light can pass straight through the lens onto the film, and then you're filming whatever you're shooting at. When you release the trigger, that prism is going to flip back, and it's going to project one frame of the watch onto the last frame of the film before the camera shuts down. So when you take the film out and develop it, what you're going to see is one frame of the watch, however many frames of the actual footage, you know, how long your burst is, and then another frame of the watch giving you a start and an end time, a timestamp. 
And this is useful for a number of reasons. Number one, you can see how long your burst actually was. And the instructor can say whether you're wasting too much ammunition, you know, not firing short enough bursts to conserve ammo. And also, if you have multiple gunners shooting at the same target, you can tell from the footage from each gun who actually hit the aircraft when. So I just, I, I love things like this where it's rather counterintuitive mechanical ways of accomplishing something that we can do very easily with digital technology today. So I don't actually have any production figures on the GC-16. It's actually quite difficult to find any information on them. But I do know that around 3,500 of the Hamilton bomb timer watches were produced. So I would imagine that production figures for the GC-16 would be around that ballpark, maybe a uh, 1,000 less or something like that, because you needed the watches, you needed spare ones, because they're small and you can easily lose them. And because only a few of those watches were ever produced, they're quite an expensive collector's item today on the open market. And you'll often see them modified to take a wrist strap. Servicemen would actually use them as wrist watches, but they were never designed for that. They were always intended to be a standalone chronometer for use in the GC-16. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. I really couldn't resist pulling this out of the museum's collection to show you. It's exactly the type of device that I love going over that has all these you know, little mechanical solutions to problems we take for granted today. This is really a great encapsulation of what this channel is all about. And I'm looking forward to continuing with my videos on the channel. And as I said before, hopefully I'll be able to make videos for the Aviation Museum as well. And those will be appearing both on the Aviation Museum's channel and right here on our own devices. I'm Jules Messier. Have a great day.